try to show you guys, and some of you were involved with the medical student efforts, and you know how to do these things. But I want to go over it, and if you have any questions, stop me and we'll go through it. This is why we're doing this. Um, I've done it a million times, and I can always learn a better way. All right, so next. Basically, it's a fact-finding mission. Be objective, record the findings, even if it makes no sense. It's good to have like a scoring sheet where you can, we usually have those, but Don just told me it wasn't fair to the other people if we gave some people that uh, list, checklist. Touch all the bases and do more if you need to. I mean, if you find out that the guy's got a facial weakness, you gotta figure out is that central, is it peripheral, you gotta do the other tests. And this is just a basic exam. But if all these things are okay, then you know that part of the nervous system is okay, and that's a huge step forward. Next. Okay, the mental status, let's not get into it. Let's just skip this. Uh, because if you're gonna examine somebody, um, let's say a comatose patient, you're not gonna get a history from that guy. Or if you have a demented guy, and he keeps on looking at his wife for, you know, what day is it today? Then you know you're not gonna get a history from him either. But the history is something that you've got to do at some point because is it's like all the fake news that we get these days. Everybody can go on the internet and say, here's what I think is going on in the world, and it's not true. So you have to verify, and um, we're verifying that these things work by these tests. Next, cranial nerves. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and find what's available. Close your eyes and tell me what it is that you are smelling. Smell anything? Yes, did you just look? Okay, now I got other <laughs> things here. Whatever you happen to have with you, you can have coffee, you can have mint, you can have orange, you can have cinnamon. It's a piece of cake, but we're done with that and we know he doesn't have Alzheimer's anytime soon. Okay, we hope. Next. Um, so I just find out, number one, do you smell something? Can you tell the difference between nothing or something? And if they say, I smell something, I don't know what it is, say they identify, they, they uh, can detect, but they can't name it. And you give them a multiple choice. And then you go on. So second cranial nerve, any questions on that one? You, I mean, it takes five seconds to do it, and you gotta ask, why not do it? You know, I got gum in my pocket so I don't offend people. Why don't I just test it? Next. Okay, now, you know how to do this. Basically, you have the little 14 inches away from the eye card. We should have this. Okay, this one, that one, how far do you have to be on that? And then this side is 14 inches, and the other side is six feet, right? So if you're gonna be over here, it takes too long. The way I do this, and you, you stop me if you, well, I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to test your heat. Okay, cover one eye, hold this, and here's what I do. Give me a pen, which here it is. This is my shortcut, and uh, don't tell anybody else about this. Are these O's or X's? We know. The other eye. So that's Jager one and that eye. I do the same thing here. And since he, once you hold that, are these E's pointing? Which direction are they pointing? Uh, to the right. Point out, point out. Okay, Jager, one plus, uncorrected, unless you've got lenses. Oh, uh, no. no Context, right. okay. So we're done with that. Okay, then how do we check for uh, pupils? Just so we got it. Yeah, so I don't know, you guys have a pen light? Okay, yeah, hit the top. Can we darken the room? We're going to see if syphilis is a problem here. No. <laughs> we're going to do, okay, look straight ahead. Okay. Dim all the lights. You got to be in a dark room. There's a couple ways of doing this. Um, what I do is I just come right at it, and there it is, and I can see it come down. And can I have that last uh, card that you just had? And then I can just have you look that way. And so in this light, the pupils are equal, and they're three millimeters, three and a half millimeters each. I'm done with that. Okay. And then visual fields. Let's turn the lights on for that. Thank you. Um, cover one eye. Okay, now what I do here is I'm normal. I may be Superman. Okay, but I try to get in between the two of us, and I'm going to check the corners because I've just checked the macula, right? How did I check the macula? 
responding to the light. That's one thing, but you don't need the macula. Yeah, because you can read the fine print. So that's the macula. Okay, so I cover my corresponding eye, his left eye, my right eye. I try to go halfway, and I go to the corners and say, how many fingers wiggle? Oh, oh, oh you wiggle, look at oh, me. wiggle, yeah. Okay, oh, okay. write them down, it's now being blocked. Yeah. <laughs> how about now? Both of them. And now? Okay, and I do the same thing on the other eye. So I've checked all the corners, and I can't tell you how many times I found there was an ICU nurse that had a, a snowmobiling accident, and a stick went inside her helmet right here and then punctured her temporal bone, the squamous portion, and got her visual fields on the other side all screwed up. Nobody picked it up, but she didn't notice the contralateral field. Temporal you know, is lower, so it's the upper field on the other side. She had a little corner, and I found out it also affected her um, limbic system a little bit, the temporal lobe. It was probably the right side because she then lost all compassion for her husband and got a divorce. So, I mean, I remember that to this day in that corner. You do that on both sides. And then, fundoscopic, I think Dr. Kadar is better at it than I am. So we're going to skip that. Any other questions? Okay, uh, next. Uh, oh, why don't we hit the uh, YouTube spot here? Do we, how much time we got? We got three hours? Yes. Let's not go take them all, but if we can turn the noise up here, if there's a way. And can you hit make it big? To the right. In this patient, you will see that the right pupil consistently dilates as the light is swung toward it. This dilation is called a relative afferent pupillary defect. It usually signifies that an optic perfusion is present on the side of the dilated pupil. One eye and not the other. This test is the most sensitive and the only objective way okay. to Can demonstrate a unilateral just, optic just, nerve lesion yeah, or bilateral. So you understand what we're showing here. We have an internal control. We got the good eye. So we come to the good eye, both pupils come down. Come to the bad eye, why are they dilating? The consensual reflex. Yes. So What's wrong with the eye when I'm trying to make, when I come to the eye and the pupils both get bigger, what's the problem? The, uh, the optic nerve from the Yes, it's an eyes. afferent pupil defect. Afferent means the second nerve detects the light, the third nerve constricts to accommodate for the light, right? Mm -hmm. Not accommodate, that's a bad word, it's confusing. But the idea is you can compare one good eye, there's not a supernormal eye, one that's defective. So this is an afferent pupil defect like you can get in many different things. It could be ocular, it could be second cranial nerve, it could be optic neuritis, optic neuropathy. It could be a lot of things, but you can, that's a very, very sensitive sign. And it's worth going from one side to the other. And you can go about this quickly and take about two seconds to go from one side to the other. It gives the pupils both time to do this and then they should constrict again when you get to the other eye, if it's the same. You get the idea? It's something that uh, is obvious to you guys already, I bet. Next. All right, now, the best way to do this is, is you probably already know this. I'm gonna take you just to see. Um, okay, look at my finger. You can't be too close because then you have the eyes not parallel, okay? And if you think about it, put one finger like this and one finger close, everybody. Look at the first finger. How many of the other fingers are there? Two. Two of them. Look at the far finger. How many of the near ones are there? Okay, so that if the eyes are not looking at the same target, you're going to see double. Mm -hmm. Okay, even, okay, but if you cover one eye, you only see one of each, right? I mean, try it. So, if you have double vision, that means two things. If the good news is, uh, you have two good eyes and you're seeing two images. Right? The bad news is, uh, it's not the same, you know, you're, you're seeing two things and your eyes are not lining up correctly. Part of it is because you're focusing on the wrong thing. And the other one is that one eye may be weak, uh, the muscle, it could be a, 
a myasthenia gravis kind of problem, in which the problem is the myoneural junction, right? It could be a myopathy, it could be many different things. But if you see double, it means it's recent, you've got two good eyes, and that's important. I remember the chairman of ophthalmology teaching me this uh, when I was on the wards, and I'd never forgotten it. So, okay, um, what else? Um, oh, let's go to a quiz. Uh, can we back up? Actually, I do want to make this point. Um, monocular diplopia is not neurological, right? It's ocular. You can get monocular diplopia. Can you tell me how you can get monocular diplopia? Like a lens defect. A lens defect. You have a dislocated lens. Some of the light's getting bent coming through that lens, and some of it's not hitting the lens. So it could be lens. It's usually the cornea. Um, if you have to have glasses like I do, and you're looking at a very small crescent moon at night, just look, and I will count, I see seven of them. Well, why do I see seven of them? It's because my cornea must be like this, that the light rays are coming in from different angles and converging on the same spot in the retina. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what, and it can be anything all the way back to, it could be a tumor that, or a dislocation of the, of the retina, so that part of the retina that should be taking care of this part is actually now taking care of this part, and the beam of light may be hitting two distant parts of the retina, even though the same thing with a tumor that pushes the retina right like this, so there's a bulge here, you get part of the retina that should be distant from the other part that's hitting pretty much the same beam of light. Makes some sense? Think about it and, okay. So there are different ways of looking at this. Pursuit movements are a different kettle of fish. Let me ask you, uh, I'll be here. Uh, what I want you to do is look, hold your head still, look way to your right, way to your left, and go back and forth fast. Okay, so she does that. Those are saccadic movements, a saccade. Anybody here speak French and smarter than I am in French? It's a tug on the reins. So when, when you want your, hip, your, your horse to go to the right, you go like this. It's a quick movement. And I don't know how many uh, degrees per second it is, but it's amazing how fast that is. A pursuit movement is using the ocular or the uh, uh, visual cortex. So when I'm testing a pursuit movement, I want to go real slow, and I'm looking to see if it is the eyes are as smooth as my movements are, because people with Parkinson's disease can't keep up and they and they do little jerks. In other conditions, you will see if you can't do a smooth pursuit, and you know there's all sorts of fine points to this, but the idea is if you do the slow pursuit, what you want to do is say, do you see just one finger everywhere, and you go up and down in like an H pattern, because that tests all of the eye muscles on each side. So if they don't see double vision, uh, they can have a terrible eye and not notice one image, but at least the eyes, then they probably are not following the signal. Does that make some sense to you? Sometimes you can break it up a little bit by putting a, a red filter or something on the eye, so then if they're able to fuse the pictures. If one's a little different, then you'll see a separation. And the further away you are in the territory of the weak muscle, the more distance there is between the red dot and the white dot, if you got a pen light. You know what I'm saying? There's all sorts of fine points that Dr. Kadar will go over, but I love the eye movements. Um, next quiz. Okay, see if you guys can answer this. Next quiz. What's wrong? The right third nail pulse. Uh, yes, but tell me. Yes, that's the conclusion. Yeah. But tell me the, the findings. The findings. Right side partial ptosis. Partial ptosis. Okay, so who cares about ptosis? Ptosis is the clue to which is the abnormal line. If it's a third nerve palsy, that's the side of the weakness. What is? It, what else do you see in a third nerve palsy? Right side uh, midriasis. Yes, in other words, bigger pupil here. This is really subtle here. And what else do you see? I'm going to ask, I should know your name. Praveen. Praveen, okay. Yes. What else is wrong with this? What do you see over here? Down and arm deviation. Yes, how do you know that? Do you see this little reflection? 
it's not the same place over here. You know, the idea is, so that's another clue. So it's not looking at the same point of light. If you're asking to look at the point of light. Okay, and then what else? What's going on up here? I mean, I'm going to ask you that one too. What's going on here that you don't see she's, here? Is this too weak trying, or is this? No, it's not. So there are wrinkles in the this side because it's partial to this triangle. Yeah, I think that's, a, yeah, okay, so next. What's wrong with this guy? Okay, okay, all right. Small so, so what is the abnormal eye? If you want to have a quick answer, say, cystitis, duh. If it's a third nerve, it's going to be on ptosis on the third mm -hmm. nerve. And what, what do you think this is? Hormones. 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 And this tells you that the, the smaller pupil here is the abnormal pupil. So if there's a difference, you know, maybe um, you know, just saw the eye doctor, and I can remember back before we had scans, and I dilated the pupil because I wanted to get a really good look at all, the whole fundus. My, view, my thing was I had to get adhesive tape that big, and I would write, I put this agent atropine in this guy's right eye, and I put the date and the time and my number and how to page me. Because, uh, you know, people have been taken to the old and operated on because the ophthalmologist or whoever did it, the medical student or resident, didn't tell anybody that they put drops in one eye. They were just practicing. I mean, seriously, that has happened. So don't let that happen on your watch. Next. Okay, this says what the cranial nerve four does. It makes the eyes cross like this. And don't do this a lot. They used to tell us as kids, or you'll stay that way, right? <laughs> I don't think that's true, but next. Okay, so what do we do with the fifth nerve? There's a whole lot that the fifth nerve does. And uh, if I could just, ask you to come up here if you could volunteer and I have a question for you close your eyes and I want to say what does this smell like go ahead and smell banana yeah so I just did that and so find something that you can test somebody's sense of smell okay so what are we going to do uh, if you really want to do this nothing colder than what's in your pocket uh, stethoscopes make people shriek right <laughs> so basically, what I do is, if you have to close your eyes, and I do this distally as well, which is colder, the first one or the second? They're both pretty cold, aren't they? Okay, how about <laughs> this one and this one? Very All right, similar. is this cool? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. So I didn't warn them, because if you go down here and they say, I don't feel anything, or here, I don't feel anything. Up here, they're going to, you know, it's going to be, well, they didn't know you were going to touch them. So his sense of touch is good, and he should be able to perceive cold, but I don't do that all the time. I just, I just say, you know, am I, close your eyes, which side am I touching? Right. Both. Uh, my left forehead and my right hand. Okay, yeah, I threw that in there because every now and then I want to come out of left field myself. So, I mean, that's easy to do. Um, corneal reflexes. Um, uh, take one and uh, skip somebody and pass it on to the next guy. Because I want you guys to all do this. And I'll let him do it on me. Okay, why do you have to know how to do the corneal reflex? Because it's something that is really, really very valuable. Have you guys all done the corneal reflex? Had it done on you? Okay, well good. Then it won't be new. Let me just show you how I do it. You want to pass it around and, and you pair up. Maybe back to body he has to be called into service here. I don't know, maybe not. Okay, take off your glasses. Oh, yeah, yeah. Done, done. So you want to find yeah. out if he's got uh, lenses on, you know, uh, contacts, then he's not going to be very, he's going to be dead to the world. Okay, let me just tell you a couple things, and you've heard this maybe. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So I want you to get. One of you is the doc and the other one is the subject, and you got to pair up differently so that you two guys are together, you two are together. Okay, and then I think you're okay. All right, so here's what I'm going to do, and see if you can do this. Ask the guy to look up and away from you. I put my hand right here, and I go like that real quick. So I, I sneak up on him where he's not looking, 
and I have my hand fixed in case he jumps, I don't want to stab him with this thing. And you should be able to do it smartly and get a blank like that. Let's see how it works, guys. All right. You can go first. All right. All right. So make a little wisp out of this, if you want. Okay. No, you see, so you, you've you got to do a point like that. So you've got to be all ready for it. And, uh, you know, you, you hit the iris part of the eye. You can't just hit the square. Hit the iris, where the color of the eye is uh, next to the pupil. Yep, okay. Some people, yeah, you hit the iris part. The cornea. It's got to hit the cornea. Okay, because it's a corneal reflex. So practice it and do it on each other. I just want to see. You may think this is easy, but it sometimes is not. Here, you do it on here. I don't know where you've been. <laughs> so you do it on, on me, okay? No, because you didn't. All right, I'm sure your hands sterile. So just do it on each other. So you've got to take off your glasses. Oh, we just did it. But you just did it, yeah. Okay, so he's going to try to do it on me, and I'll see if I don't faint. <laughs> I have faith in it. Not from this. There should be no blood involved, right? Okay, all right. That was very mild, but that's good. And the other thing to do is while you're at it, did you all get a chance to do this? Okay, one of you pretend like you're in coma, close your eyes. Okay. <laughs> Wait a minute, are we all, Naveen? Okay, okay, one of you is in coma, okay? Pick who's in coma. Okay, the, the, the comatose guy closes his eyes, the other guy looks at me. So, okay, comatose guy in coma, close your eyes. Okay, here's what you're gonna do. You, you're gonna do this, close your eyes, and then see if you can hold still. Try that on, on the comatose patient, try that. Okay, so I defy you. You find somebody that's you find somebody that's malingering right away. You find out that they're malingering, or that they're really able to move. We don't use such terms. The other thing that you can do is on the comatose guy. Now the other way around. Okay, so you switch places here. So now the guy who was doing this is now the comatose guy. I want to show you something else that you can do. Okay. And this is what I want you to do. Are, are you ready? Okay, all right. What I'm going to ask you to do is... Okay, so you, so you want to do me? No, no, you already... Okay, so I get to do this on you. Close your eyes. And I go like that, okay? And what happens is you get the same thing, right? You touch the cilia, the, eyel the eye eyelashes, and you get a blink. You get a bilateral blink, and that's a poor man's corneal. Right? Because you've tested five in and seven out, right? So that's another way, this occurred to me one day. The other thing I do when I'm doing this is I break it so I don't use it on the next guy. It's just something I've learned over the years because I don't want to do it twice. I mean, I'm not that cheap. <laughs> well, there are people that use the same needles again, and you gotta just break yourself with those kind of, you got the idea? <laughs> right, okay, the other way I can check um, for visual fields, let's say, in a guy, okay, fake coma, so pretend like you're blind, eyes open. Okay, so doc, I can't see anything. Okay, uh, so then I go like that, and he, he, he winced, right? Another thing, we had a guy in the ER over at the VA, and this guy was, you know, saying, I can't see anything down. And then he'd look me in the face every now and then, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, get a mirror. So I put a mirror up where this guy's gaze was, and I started moving the mirror around, and he started looking at it. Because, boy, if there's anything that we care about is, how do I look today? You know? <laughs> Am I looking really sharp? So, I mean, that's another clue. You can put, okay, so the guy does have vision. If you go like this and he blinks, you know, just make sure you don't really hit him. <laughs> um, okay, uh, where are we here? Geroid muscles, you know, you, you can just go back and forth like this. And then sometimes if you have a tongue blade, I think I've got one here somewhere. Was there a tongue blade in the bunch? Yeah. So I'm going to test to see how strong your jaw muscle is, okay? So I'm going to have you put this back on one side, crunch it as hard as you can. Harder. Okay, don't let me pull it out. Okay, <laughs> now open your jaw. So what, what I usually do is, 
You should be able to crack it, put a splinter in it, or at least put teeth marks in it if you have good teeth. And you shouldn't be able to easily pull it out, but you've got to be careful with people with false teeth and other things. So that's a good test for how strong, you know, as you get older, you lose, I don't know, what percentage of your jaw strength. And I just sometimes say, okay, open and close your jaw, and I can feel the temporalis and the masseter muscles, and they're roughly equal, and, you know, there's a lot of other ways to doing it. Uh, corneal jerk. I mean a, a jaw jerk. What they say in England when I was over there is look daft. It is like, okay, good. So we just relax totally. And uh, I had one guy that had what they call disseminated sclerosis over there. I still have my little little book that I bought, the, the Royal Majesty's Service. I don't know whatever it was. Uh, and some guy that had. So when I hit him there. All four of his extremities you know, sprained like this. He had really bad MS. Um, but you know, if you don't get it, it's not a big deal. What, what next? We're taking longer this time than usual, aren't we? But these guys. Uh, okay. So this just goes to show you that if you're testing for touch, and I don't believe in hurting people with pins. Usually, you can just say, "Do you feel something here?" or "Where, where do you feel it?" and they point to it, something like that. But if they're faking it, the angle of the jaw should not be involved in the fifth nerve lesion. And you should just know this is just approximate, but these are the, and it stops not here where my hairline used to be, but it stops about here. And what's after that? C1 or C2 or what? C There's no C1. C they should have called, right? They should have called C2, C1, and then we wouldn't have the the problems we do in the cervical thoracic junction. Okay, but that's okay, next. Okay, this is a nice way, it's a nice face to look at, number one, but it shows you the third nerve is like three pillars in a Greek temple holding the roof on. So the job of the third nerve is to open the eye. So without a third nerve functioning, your eyes shut. And then you go like this and you find out the guy's looking down and out and the pupil is big on that side. Sometimes you have to do that. The seventh nerve is something that shuts the eyes, like my job and if I did something wrong in school, I had to wash the blackboards and pull the shades down at the end of the day. I, not that I was ever wrong, but... Um, so this, the seventh nerve pulls the eyes shut. In case you can't remember it on the test and you're mixed up and you haven't gone to sleep for a while, that's a way to remember. Eighth nerve, Seventh nerve, oh, facial muscles. Basically what I do is just have people shut their eyes really tight and then make the platysma muscle stand out. Can you guys all do that now? I can check to see if you're okay. You got it, okay. All right, you gotta <laughs> shut your eyes though when you do it, so okay, all right. No, I, I mean like jam them shut. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and then if you want to, okay, I want you to jam your eyes really shut tight. See if you can open up the other guy's eyes. You know, don't go sticking your hands in there, but you should be able to not open the other guy's eyes. So check each other on that. Can, if somebody really shuts their eyes really tight, and if you're above the eyebrows, can you open the eyes? No, you shouldn't be able to. So in people with MS or myopathy or myasthenia gravis, they may be weak on one side. And if they've had a seventh nerve palsy, they ought to be weak because seven shuts the eyes, right? When you have a bad seventh nerve palsy, you've got to even take the eye shut at night so it doesn't dry out. Okay, eighth nerve next. Uh, okay, this is a, where's, when I first saw this, I said, what is a guy doing making funny faces on the right side? But he should be doing the same thing on this side. So what's wrong with uh, this guy? Fifth side facial palsy. Okay, because he can't shut the eye, do you remember? So uh, I've been asked to see somebody who's had a facial palsy now for like three or four months. Okay, some people don't ever recover. Some people may take months to recover. Depends on, and you know what aberrant regeneration is? Okay, if you have a bad enough lesion, even if it's not a compression, the nerve has to grow back. And if it's disrupted to the point where all the little tubes of myelin are a little disrupted, the wire may go to the wrong down the wrong tube. And instead of shutting the eye, it tightens up the muscle down here. 
So when some people blink after a really bad Bell's palsy, they'll have aberrant regeneration and you can see a, another part of the face twitch inappropriately, understand? Happens in peripheral um, neuropathies as well. Next. Okay, so this is one way to remember third and seventh. Next. Okay, now, the, you know what the Calfrast is? Dr. Torres ever talked about this? He has actually standardized this so that, I, I don't know how to do it, but you put your arms away out like this and you try to see how close you have to come or how loud. My favorite thing is, close your eyes, tell me where the noise is. Yes. Okay, so if I can do just the minimal and he gets it, that's pretty good. But there are some people with high frequency hearing loss. Is there anything going on? Do you hear anything in the room right now? Voice of the... The fan. Does anybody not hear the fan? Okay, so if you have high frequency hearing, you can hear the fan. The older people in the room or the people that have been uh, yelling at each other too much or whatever, <laughs> noise-induced trauma, or some other problem with hearing, can't hear the high frequencies. And you know, there are audiograms, there are a lot better ways of doing this. But if you have, let's say, a conductive hearing loss, I want you to try this experiment on yourselves right now. <clears throat> uh, let's give yourself a conductive loss. So you put your finger like this, okay, push hard. And I want you to do it too. You're, you're behind the times. You're delaying us all here. Hum and tell me where the humming goes. Both sides. To the side you're including, right? That's a conductive hearing loss, right? That's how you figure it out. Um, and there's ways of doing it. Do you do the Weber Rene test? You know how to do that? Yeah. One way to do this is I'm going to ask you. Do you hear something? Where do you hear it? You're buzzing on both sides. Both sides, okay. Uh, you hear the noise, it, you know uh, what frequency is it? Uh, there was a guy who was a musician that says, oh, that's 128. That's, that's a middle C or low C. I said, yeah, how do you know that? So some people have perfect pitch. So you should be able to hear it on both sides, but the ENT people actually put it right on the teeth sometimes. I can't bear doing that. I mean, it vibrates and I can't, okay. But so here's how you tell whether bone is better than air conduction. So make a noise, put it on the mastoid and say, which is louder, behind the ear or in front? Uh, but pay attention here, okay. Behind the ear or in front? Front. That's the right answer. And that's the way it should be. I mean, you can hear it, because your bone conducts it, but if you put it right next to your ear, the ear should be a little louder. And you got to move quick. You got to go from here to here. The ear should be a little louder in most people. Okay, so if there's a conductive loss, if you go like this, you hear it. You, you can test yourself. In the elevator, if you don't have a good review article handy, <laughs> Do this, and the psychiatrist will, you know, walk by and say, "Look at this guy. He's, he's. Uh, I don't know. There's got to be a word, a, a term in psychology for that." Any questions on any of this? Okay. So what's next? Uh, okay. The gag response. Um, I don't think we need to do this again, but basically, <laughs> you're not interested in that. <laughs> so basically, you take something that's clean. Oh, there's something. Uh, no, this has we, not been that's used. Not used. It's, it's been, been used. Yeah. Okay, all right, so you're off the hook. Um, but anyway, you know, what you have to do is actually touch the back part of the pharynx. There's this tongue here. There's a tongue blade. <laughs> no, that's okay. Actually, I have found that when I'm doing this on a comatose patient or on cooperative patient, there was one guy, I don't know what he had, but uh, I think it was cerebral palsy, among other things. And I got his mouth open and I touched him and I was trying to figure out how can I do the other cranial nerves. So when I touched him, he had such a hyperactive gag response that he went just like that. So I got seven, I got the palate elevation, I got the tongue protrusion, and it was it was like I said, man, thank you. You know, I'm I'm quick here today. But so there's other ways of doing it. If you can see a good effort and the tongue doesn't protrude to one side, 
then you've tested 12 in a guy that's totally uncooperative and you haven't heard him. The other thing is, first, don't hurt the person. Okay, next. Okay, for the, this is really easy, I think, but let me show you the motor exam and then you guys can practice on each other. Is that what you're supposed to be doing today? Stop me if I'm yeah, totally I, inappropriate. I you okay, so you've seen this, but I'm gonna just see how strong you are. Okay, so what I do here is when I do the motor exam, I do 11 with it, and this is how I do it. I ask the person to turn their head this way and don't let me move it. So then I'm pushing it here and I see the sternum, I, the mastoid, and I like to use my senses. I'm a sensory sort of person. So, okay, so I can look, I can feel, I can see how strong it is at the same time. And then the other way, don't let me move it, because if you don't say, don't let me move it, and you start doing this, the guy will say, you want me to move my head this way? What, what do you want me to do? So you just say, hold still, and that's the way to do it. Okay, so then I'm gonna continue, shrug your shoulders, lift up your elbows, shrug your shoulders still, okay? And I push it down here while I'm at it. Okay, I really lean on it because I wanna see if he's stronger than me. I got this competitive nature. <laughs> Hold your arms like this. Do not let me pull you. And, okay, push me away hard as you can. Come on. Okay. And, <laughs> so he's giving maximum effort. Bend your wrist this way. Don't let me move him. Okay, I can overcome him a little bit so the weightlifting pays off. Goes like, go like this. Don't let me pull up at all. And so far, he's pretty surprisingly good. Fingers <laughs> way apart. And I can always win this one. <laughs> okay, and if I have a question, well, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm just so strong, then we have a pinky war. My DIP joint versus his, and see who gets in. And I think he's actually beating me today. And my left and his left, assuming that, okay? So that's how you tell, okay? The other, there's lots, lots of other ways to do this. And then I do this, squeeze the heck out of my hands, try to hurt me. That's enough pain for me. So that's the, upper extremity. You can do a whole lot more than that, and there's myotone pictures and everything. Keep your knees apart. Okay, bring them together, and I should not be able to move them. Lift your knee up a little bit. Don't let me pull your foot. Okay, this one. Okay, now try to straighten the leg, and I'll try to stop you, and I should not be able to stop him from straightening his leg. This is a sneaky way to check for sciatica and other problems. No, no, you, you're too late. <laughs> so, they, so, so the patients go to their, they were in a measly car accident and they want a free ride. And they go see the, de the, uh, the dentist, no, the uh, lawyer, and they say, okay, anytime you're laying there like this and they start picking up your leg, say, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow. Oh. Okay, when they get close, you know, they just try to be consistent. Well, I've already got him at 90 degrees here, don't I? Yeah. He's not howling. So when I see a patient in the clinic and they say, oh, I've got really bad sciatica, doc. I did have a lady with us the other day. So I say, well, let's do an exam of your hip, your knee, and your ankle. So go like this. Cross your legs like a man. And I say, if you've got hip problems, this ought to hurt a little bit, right? to the other side. So I say, well, you know, if you have hip disease, it may hurt in the knee. If you have knee disease, it may hurt in the hip. You're not really sure where the pain's really coming from. This is a good test. So, and I'm gonna say, well, let's check your knee. And he's at 90 degrees. And he didn't realize somebody was gonna do this this way. Relax your knee, and what I like to do is, is see if there's clonus and I can push down and. You have to be careful because some people uh, really do have painful knees. And then while I'm at this, you know, what's Sperling sign? You have somebody, it's typically done like this. You bring your leg up and then when it hurts with sciatica pain, you go down just a touch and dorsiflex the foot. What you're doing with this is you're pulling on the Achilles tendon, which pulls on the sciatic nerve indirectly. And even though your back where it didn't hurt them, they say, ouch, yes. No, I'm There's a couple missing. of spurling signs, but that's the one I mean by that. And maybe Lesage's test, and there's other ways, but this is my test. 
So what I do is without them knowing it, I say, oh, push your foot down this way, which is the control, push your foot up this way, and if he doesn't howl, then he doesn't have sciatic nerve problems. So this lady that I did see, she did have sciatic distribution problems, but she had a sciatic notch problem, or piriformis syndrome. So if you push right around that area, there's a little opening where it's tender on all of us, but if it's really tender, then that's probably where the problem is. Okay, so, um, and while I've done this, I've, I've uh, checked everything here because I push down hard as you can and push up. A better way to test this is such a strong muscle, the gastroc and soleus, that you probably are better off doing it with gait analysis. Next, I think I got out of, okay, um, the 12th palsy we already talked about, the, oh yeah, let's do the motor exam.